Now, continuing our look at the history of science, we've kind of reached the 20th century, talked about the reconciliation between mentalism and evolution, and got to World War II. It's now post-World War II. After World War II, we have a number of different things that happen. So the Soviet Union and the U.S. enter into an arms and influence race. So the Korean War happens, which is really a war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, but fought in Korea. Uh, 1957, Sputnik is this first satellite uh, launched by the Soviet Union, and it mobilizes, that is to say scares the U.S., mobilizes the U.S. to invest heavily in science education and research. The government dumps a bunch of money into science education and research, and arguably the U.S. is still coasting along on the benefits of this huge government action that came out of fear that we were losing this competition with the Soviet Union. 1962, we have the Cuban Missile Crisis, when lots of people thought the world was going to end. Then we have the Vietnam War, so again, this is a war basically between the Soviet Union and the U.S., but fought in Vietnam. 87, the Soviet Union starts, uh, has a little bit of democracy. Once you give people a little bit of democracy, you can't keep the whole thing from falling to pieces, so that happens pretty quickly. So, second half of the 20th century, by the end of it, the U.S. is now the one standing, right? So the U.S. is the worldwide academic and scientific leader. We have the best universities. We have the best scientists. We have the most good universities. It's not even close. Globally, there's a rural to urban lifestyle trend, right? People used to live in the countryside and be farmers, and now they move to cities and they do things other than being farmers. And you have the begins these megacities, right? Los Angeles, 50 miles by 50 miles of concrete. This is new, right? This is a very strange thing. Like living in LA, we don't see nature at all, really, anymore. There's an interesting book called The Last Child in the Woods. This guy makes this argument that children today grow up without experiencing nature, without seeing firsthand the different types of animals and plants that are out there, without actually seeing the variation, right? So lots of the things that previously we could have counted on everybody knowing about nature as they come to kind of think about evolution and change, this is no longer true, right? People haven't seen diversity. They haven't seen variation anymore because they're all living in megacities now. And that's true globally. You can argue that in the US there's now a new anti-intellectualism, right? So we used to be really proud of being smart. And now if you're really smart, um, you might actually want to keep that kind of quiet sometimes around your friends. That is not true in places like India and China where if you're really smart, that's, that's good socially. We have this great divergence in the US where um, rich people are getting richer and everybody else is staying basically the same. That's a new thing. Uh, and India and China are becoming more technologically savvy. They're starting to have their own innovations, their own manufacturing, right? China now does almost all the manufacturing for the US, for example. And now in the late 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, we start to see computers and robots replacing some people's jobs. So what jobs they replace? They're replacing all the ones in the middle. If you're a very, very highly skilled person, we can't really design a computer or a robot to replace you. So you, uh, you get to keep your job. If you're performing a very, very low skilled menial job, then you're probably not being paid very much, so it's not economically worth it to replace that person with a computer or a robot. What's being replaced is the people in the middle, right? So if you've ever watched Mad Men, there's like a whole room of women that are typing away, typing up letters those people have been replaced by word processors. So all those jobs in the middle that required some skill, they're disappearing. That's part of this great divergence. Yeah, so that's the future. <laughs> uh, and then another thing that's happening in the 20th century is that capitalism is becoming kind of a moral good all on its own, right? So for most of human history, we didn't really think about making money and profit and consumption and economic growth as a good thing all on its own, it has now become a good thing, right? Companies and CEOs are judged on their profit, not on their benefit to society. And again, this is kind of new for the 20th century and the 21st century. So this is kind of the social background, the cultural background about what's happening now. What's some of the science that's happened after World War II? So this little symbol here is indicating that Earlier in the semester, I talked about how interdisciplinary evolution is. What we see now in the 20th century is ideas from evolution making their impact in a variety of other fields. So here's Ernst Mayer, kind of out in the field. He wrote a book called Systematics and the Origin of Species, 
what he did is he took these population genetics ideas that came from the modern synthesis and used those ideas to describe things like allopatric speciation. So how do species arise and become different? Well, you can actually explain that with population genetics. And he's the one who redefined a species from a type, like Linnaeus would have described it, to a group of interbreeding individuals, which is a definition that's a lot more like something from population genetics than from something from Linnaeus. So if you've had this definition of a species as a group of individuals that can interbreed with each other, this is the guy who came up with that definition, and that definition comes from population genetics. G.G. Simpson, a paleontologist, he's taking population genetics ideas and putting them into paleontology and talking about how the tempo and mode, the patterns we see in the fossil record can be explained by evolution and again from population genetics type ideas. A little bit later in the 20th century we have, uh, this is Mutu Kimura, so he used very sophisticated models of mathematics and brought them into population genetics. So math so complicated that you wouldn't want to see the equations. And describe things like what is the probability of fixing an allele? If there's a new mutation that's good, is it automatically going to increase in frequency and the population will, in the future, everybody will have it? Or not? And it turns out not, but what's the probability? He figured it out. And how long does that take if it does occur? How many generations? Mathematics by this guy. And then he came up with an idea called the neutral theory of molecular evolution that although maybe most of the physical differences in organisms are due to natural selection, when you look at the DNA or maybe even the amino acids that they have, it's not natural selection that's causing all those differences. Maybe it's just drift or random chance that maybe most mutations are selectively neutral, not causing a difference in the fitness of the individual, and they can randomly fix and the population will evolve at the molecular level, not because of natural selection, but because of stochastic or random processes. So he had a student, Tomoko Ota, who found evidence that contrasted with this neutral theory of molecular evolution and proposed the nearly neutral theory of molecular evolution, which holds that most mutations are slightly deleterious, so you wouldn't even notice them if you saw them in an individual, but they still can be influenced by natural selection. And this actually causes the data to better match with uh, the predictions of this theory. So we see the same sort of thing that I talked about earlier in the course where you have a hypothesis, you make a proposal, it makes some predictions, they're good for a while, there are some predictions that aren't very good, so that hypothesis or theory is weakened, so then it's replaced by a newer one that makes better predictions. And science is a collaborative enterprise, right? This person plus this person gets us this modern theory that's pretty good. Uh, so German, Willy Hennig, so he is looking at phylogenies, these diagrams that are going to depict how things are related to each other, and he argued for a, a technique called cladistics as a method, um, basically saying that we can be objective when we do our phylogenetics. When we make our phylogenies, when we describe how things are related, we don't just have an opinion and think about them, we can actually use a mathematical method to come up with these relationships. Uh, Linus Pauling and Emil Zuckerkandl, they came up with this idea of a molecular clock based on protein sequence, which allows rates of change. So if you compare different species to each other, you can count the number of amino acid differences they have, and the more distantly related they are, the more differences there will be. And you can calibrate, and you can get like a rate of that, if you have just a little bit of fossil evidence to put some numbers on it, you can say something like two species that are 20 amino acids different from each other have been separate for twice as long as two species that are 10 amino acids different from each other. And if you know it's a certain number of amino acids per million year, and you can get that, some of that date from fossils, you could maybe figure out how long ago different species diverged, even if you don't have fossils for some of their ancestors. And so this is the beginning of molecular evolution, the idea that we can study proteins and DNA sequences and their evolution kind of all on their own, not even worrying too much about what the organisms look like, we can actually focus on some of the genes. The last two we'll look at, not necessarily because they're kind of the greatest evolutionary biologists, so to speak, but because they're kind of the highest profile ones. So we have Stephen Jay Gould, who is famous enough to get himself into The Simpsons. He went back, and if you remember this guy Heckel from the 1800s, who had this idea of ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny, he wrote a book called Ontogeny and Phylogeny that was a better 
more sophisticated approach to how the history of a species may account for some of the quirks and details of the development of individuals in those species. And so kind of starting a new field of evo devo, so how is evolution and development related? With a collaborator, Niles Eldridge, he came up with a theory of punctuated evolution or punctuated equilibrium. This is a mix of uniformitarianism and saltational processes, so kind of a mix of long periods of gradual evolution interspersed with rapid changes. And he was also an exceptional science writer. He wrote a lot of essays for the public and is one of the major people of the 20th century, maybe him and Carl Sagan, who really did the best to bring science to the masses. And then this is uh, Richard Dawkins. So Richard Dawkins, his approach was to think about evolution. Normally we think about you know, the phenotypes of organisms, and we think about the genotypes of organisms, right? The genes make the, the organism. Selection acts on what the organism looks like. Heredity is here, right? Genotypes are what is inherited. He argued that basically you could just ignore this part, not worry about what the organism looked like, just look at the genotypes, and you can think about genes evolving, and that maybe that's the only or the most important level. Let's not worry about individuals. Let's not worry about populations. Let's just think about genes and how their fitness might differ, and maybe that's a better, more interesting way of thinking about evolution. And this genetic focused idea is very influential in terms of how we think about evolution now. Now, late in his career, he's become uh, like an atheism activist, so he's kind of moved away from being an evolutionary biologist and more into doing something different and more like social philosophy instead of science. And so what are the current hot topics? What are the big things that are being worked on today? So developmental biology, uh, revisiting Heckel with better technology. We have all sorts of genetic techniques and protein-based techniques that allow us to see things he could have only imagined. And we have phylogenies and a knowledge of the history of species to work with. Genomics and bioinformatics, so brand new data sets, thousands of times more information than our previous sets of morphological characters, right? So, Whereas before we had organisms and we could talk about how big they were or what color they were, now we have genomes and we can talk about all their DNA sequences. So we have phylogenetics, so DNA sequencing, we can sequence large stretches of DNA from a large number of individuals and species, and then we have computers that are powerful enough to make the phylogenies that will tell us how these species are related to each other. Paleontology is still the only way to see what life looked like, right? DNA sequences don't tell you really what it looked like. Paleontology does. And paleontology is relatively cheap, and so a lot of new countries that are trying to build a scientific culture are doing paleontology. So in fact, there's a lot of really interesting paleontology that's been coming out of China over the last 20 years because the nation sees it as a way to do science and build their reputation, and they have an entire country that's essentially unexplored. And evolutionary medicine is a new field within medicine. So studying not just how does our evolutionary history influence our modern physiology and anatomy, but also studying variation in human populations. So remember, variation is now key and important for evolution. Evolutionary biologists are the biologists that think the most about variation, and variation is what causes genetic diseases. Genetic diseases are genetic variants that cause problems. And so it's the evolutionary biologists who have an entire culture of thinking about variation, thinking about populations, and so they can give a new approach to studying medically relevant genetic disorders that other types of biologists don't have. They have different approaches that have other benefits.